Hi, this is Mike Maloney, and I've got a very special guest with me, Brandon Hargreaves, to update us on Hashgraph, Hedera Hashgraph. Brandon, how are you? Uh, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, Mike. I, I do want to say that, you know, I do some contract work for the HBAR Foundation, which has been tasked uh, to, to build out the Hedera ecosystem, which we're going to be talking about. But I'm just here personally today. I, I want to make sure I could speak a little more freely. Okay, well, that's great, because we want you speaking as freely as possible. Now, I want to disclose to everybody uh, before we start this that, uh, that uh, I am an early investor in Hedera Hashgraph. Uh, we were offered a position well after coming out with our episode eight of Hidden Secrets of Money. So uh, we had done something that uh, we, because we thought it was a great technology several months later they came to us and made an offer so uh, we weren't uh doing any front running or anything like that just want to disclose that but before we get started here i want to ask you some uh very simple questions because i just don't understand why right now uh hashgraph is hedera hashgraph the h bar token is stuck down at around a nickel <laughs> <laughs> to me, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever uh, because uh, the way I see this is very, very simple. You know a lot about what this does, but I look at, at it from some very simple primary aspects. And so I want to uh, ask you these questions to, to confirm whether my take on Hedera Hashgraph is correct or not. Is it uh, the fastest or equal to the fastest tokens, the fastest uh, distributed ledgers that there are out there. Yeah, well, there, there's a couple ways we measure speed. One is is how long it takes to confirm a transaction. That's called time to finality. And Hedera is at or near the best in class as far as that, uh, down around five seconds to reach finality. And then there's also throughput. How many transactions per second can it handle? And right now it's throttled down to 10,000 transactions per second, but that throttle can be lifted to many tens of thousands of trans uh, transactions per second. And actually the, the system's already designed to be sharded. So it could be split up and it could essentially unlimited scaling. So it can handle whatever is necessary. So speed, yeah, check that one off. <laughs> well, you just answered uh, my, I think it was my final question or second to final question. Is it the most scalable? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. There's no question about that. That's, that's already been checked off for sure. Okay, so this could actually replace like uh, Visa, MasterCard, all bank transactions, all Wall Street transactions. Uh, it's a distributed ledger that can pretty much do all of these things. Absolutely. Is it the most versatile? Can it do everything that every other token, or did I ask that already? No, you, <laughs> yeah. you got it. It, it is it can do everything that every any other token can do out there, any other crypto. It is very versatile. It has, you know, a smart contract system that it's very versatile. It has a token service, which a lot of platforms don't have. Uh, it has a data logging service, essentially. It's called Hedera Consensus Service. Uh, so yes, it can do everything that these other networks can do. It's it's not like uh, a one trick pony or even like a Swiss army knife that can do several things okay. It's, it's like an iPhone. It can do all kinds of different things uh, and it has all kinds of tools to do so. Okay, so... Um, fastest, fairest, safest, safety being looking at it from the user's point of view. Uh, if, if you go into this, is it always going to be there? Are you going to be able to get out of it? In other words, um, is it, uh, are, are, is, is Hashgraph trying to be compliant with like securities and exchange rules mm -hmm. and, uh, and governments so that it doesn't get impeded or shut down in any way, or the on and off ramps blocked to where you can't go uh, from dollars into uh, HBAR and out of HBAR back to dollars so that you can buy a house with it or whatever. 
Absolutely. So they, they've tried to do things the right way from the very beginning, from when it was initially founded as Hedera, and now the governance has been transferred over to the Governing Council, which is blue chip companies that are throughout the world. So Google, IBM, Boeing, Deutsche Telekom, and the list goes on. There's 29 right now. Uh, and, and they always have to do things in, in a compliant way. So absolutely, they're doing everything they need to do to make sure this is going to meet their stated goal of being a, a hundred year endeavor. Of course, they want to go beyond that but that's what they usually say is that's the goal to make sure this is around in a hundred years wow okay uh then is it the most secure secure meaning uh resistant to hacking mm -hmm. so that uh something from the outside can't cause it to collapse yeah, absolutely. So first of all, its base layer, the hash graph, is ABFT. It has the gold standard of security, and it's asynchronous Byzantine fault tolerance. A lot of, most of, I actually haven't heard of another platform that has this, and not only do they have it, but they've proved it with a Carnegie Mellon COQ proof. So the base layer is, is as secure as you can get. The things that I'm sorry, my screen just went black. But uh, the <laughs> the uh, things that are built on top of it are, are computer code, and they try to have as much rigor around that as possible. And yes, so absolutely, it is it is the most secure at that base layer. And then the services that are built on top of it, they go through processes to take it through the, the preview net, the test net, and so forth to make sure that by the time it makes it to, to main net, it's really secure. Okay. Uh, there's already some uh, pretty amazing apps being developed that uh, sit on top of the distributed ledger. Uh, but, uh, you know, we said most versatile. Is this something that uh, could actually, you know, with, with a correct program being uh, sitting on top of the distributed ledger that is Hashgraph, uh, could this do things like securely run uh, with, you know, one of the things about distributed ledgers is you've got a backup. If the power goes out somewhere, the whole system doesn't collapse. Sure. Uh, uh, could this uh, run the traffic grid, the energy grid and the water grid uh, worldwide, basically? It certainly could. And I think it goes back to, you know, we talk about this industry as being the blockchain industry. And blockchain itself isn't very descriptive. Actually, it's just one way that you can run yeah. one of these cryptocurrency platforms. Can I stop you right sure. there and just ask? So uh, from my understanding, there is basically blockchain, which is every other distributed ledger out there. And there is Hashgraph, which is unique and different. And it is not blockchain. Please go ahead. <laughs> there, there are other platforms that run other consensus mechanisms, but Hashgraph is unique to Hedera. And a better way to describe these is distributed ledger technology. These are ledgers. The, the thing is, you know, we deal with ledgers every day, all the time in the form of spreadsheets. We have, um, you know, Excel or Google Sheets and things along those lines. And you can think of these just like that, only it's distributed and uh, decentralized. So you can think about all the rows in those spreadsheets as the accounts, the who, who owns the assets. And these can be individuals, these can be businesses, or like you said, these can be things. They can be parking meters or charging sta stations or washing machines or a printer that needs to buy ink or something along those lines. Um, and then in all of the columns of that spreadsheet, you have the what the assets, the things of value that you have that are on there. So HBAR is one of those assets. It is the native cryptocurrency of Hedera. It's used to pay the fees on the Hedera network, which are priced in dollars, but they are paid in the HBAR. It's also used to secure the network because Hedera is a proof of stake network, but we won't get into that. Uh, but you have other assets like uh -huh. USDC, for example. Well, is before you get sure bookmark that because I want you to come back to it. Yeah. But you mentioned payments, mm -hmm. and one of the things that's great about HBAR, the transaction costs are so low that you can do micropayments. Tell us about that. Sure. So, I mean, right now for the Hedera Consensus Service or HBAR transactions, the price of 
doing one of those things is one one hundredth of a cent. It, it opens up the possibility of allowing you to do true micro payments at very low cost, unlike some some other networks that have some fairly significant fees. And that might not matter if you're sending something or doing a transaction that's a thousand dollars or a hundred dollars or whatever. Uh, but it really does matter once you get down to a penny. Where with Hedera, you can do that and even subset transactions uh, economically. Right with. With Bitcoin, for instance, and, and now I'm going to get flack in the in the comments section, but could it cost you like $20 to do a one penny transaction? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So the, their their fees change in dollar terms where Hedera's don't. Um, but yeah, they've gone up to when they had ordinals first come out. I mean, I think it was like 40 or $50. And that happens on Ethereum, another a DLT network on a fairly regular basis. Yeah, D, just to remind everybody, DLT is distributed ledger technology, uh -huh. uh, and uh, it's when these the distributed ledgers are what counts. All cryptos are based. Well, actually, not all. There are centralized distributed. There are center, centralized blockchain ledgers, mm -hmm. but um, most of the public cryptocurrencies are on a distributed ledger, and uh, that is the thing. One of uh, this a valuable technology is this resistance, you know, something we'll touch on later called anti-fragile. Uh, but uh, yeah, so um, just uh, go on with what you were saying. I had you put a bookmark in U.S. Sure. Uh, well, yeah. we, we were talking about all the things in the columns of those uh, distributed ledgers in that spreadsheet. Like USDC is a stable coin. Uh, it's on the Hedera network and it represents the dollar. You could even have art, things like grand sculptures that you fractionalize or even JPEGs, the little PFPs that you see that go for crazy prices. But it also could be, like you said, it could be stocks, bonds, securities of all kinds, real estate, or it could just be information. We talked about the Hedera consensus service. So you could just log information in this spreadsheet as well. And that's what these DLTs do. They, they maintain and they handle the swaps of these assets between accounts. And again, it can be programmed to do this automatically when certain conditions are met. Now, the, the most simple condition is when uh, an individual individual, one of those account holders decides to send one asset to another account. And all you do is pick which asset you want to send, you define how much you want to send, you define what that other account number is. And for Hedera, it's just numbers. A lot of other ones are these alphanumeric strings. For Hedera, it's just 0 0.0.1234567. And then you just click send and it goes uh, between those. But there's also smart contracts, which I think the best way to describe that is to give an example, but we can get into that in a minute. Uh, but that makes it so you can do all kinds of fantastic things. We, we have people that, uh, you know, at our workplace or, you know, at, at a school or at our church that are Excel wizards, right? And they can do amazing things that you wouldn't think is possible. It's the same thing here. You can do amazing things with these distributed ledgers. Excellent. So um, uh, if I were a patent attorney, I might be worried. <laughs> Trademarks. Uh, so uh, could if uh, like the patent office uh, used this so that you could then uh, create a patent. The system would uh, double check it against all other patents. Uh, you could then be able to license and sell, license and or sell the patent to somebody uh, very, very quickly and easily as easily as uh, making a phone call. Am I correct? Absolutely. The, the different use cases are unlimited. It's going to touch every industry. There's no question about that. To get back into those smart contracts and just give an example of one that's used the most throughout our industry, people might have heard the term DeFi or decentralized finance. Uh, pretty much they're running markets in these decentralized exchanges in a new way where you normally have an exchange and you have a centralized custodian who participants go and they have bids and asks. And when those bids and asks meet each other, that's when the transfer of the asset occurs. Well, with these decentralized exchanges, they set up a smart contract. And what people do is they take equal values of two assets. We'll say HBAR and USDC. And there's a ratio, a price between those two. And we'll say it's 20 HBAR to one USDC. And people start to add liquidity to that smart contract in that ratio. And they continue to add that up until it's at 
um, you know, a significant amount. We'll say there's a million dollars, 500,000 of each. Once you get to that point, that money just sits there or not money, but those, uh, those assets just sit there. <laughs> I, I don't, I don't want to go against your, your definition of money there, Mike. So those assets yeah. just sit there until somebody want to interact with it. And what they do is we'll, well say they want to. Hang on one second. If, sure. if there, if both of the assets are there and it's a, as a, a fixed amount of one asset against another, they are storing value. As long as they sit there at that fixed amount, they're not sure. fluctuating against each other. They're storing value. So at that point, maybe the U.S. dollar becomes money once again. <laughs> there you go. There you go. But then that smart contract, it just sits there and waits for somebody that wants to trade USD for, for uh, HBAR. So they'll send however much USDC at a ratio of 20 to 1, they'll get HBAR back. But now in that smart contract, there's more USDC than there is HBAR. We'll say now it's 19 to 1. So now the ratio has changed. Uh, and somebody might see that and say, hey, over on this centralized exchange or over on this other decentralized exchange, it's still 20 to 1. I'm going to buy it, buy the H bar at 20 to 1 and sell it for 19 to 1. And it equalizes it. That's called an arbitrage opportunity. But that can be done automatically as well. So you can have a script written, a bot that is automatically looking at these different exchanges. And when it sees that discrepancy, it interacts with an API, an application program and interface that can pretty much talks between these, uh, gives the the script, the bot, the ability to talk and interact with these different platforms. And it can automatically balance out and equalize those prices between the exchanges. And it's amazing because DeFi has just been around for a few years now, but it's shown to be amazingly resilient. We've seen huge fluctuations in prices. If in the traditional markets, you had like a 50% drawdown in a day or a 50% drop in, in price, stuff would start to break. But these DeFi platforms don't. And I think it's starting to prove that these networks are anti-fragile, which is really interesting. And I know we wanted to get the, into that a little bit, but I'll take a little bit of pause there to see if you have any feedback there, Mike. Uh, no, I think we should go right into anti-fragile. Sure. I've, I've read most of that book. Um, uh, it, <laughs> there were some some areas get sort of long and drawn out in the book. <laughs> I, I, I hear you. gave up, but uh, it is a wonderful concept uh, where uh, when something is stressed, instead of potentially breaking that thing, uh, that thing automatically gets stronger to resist that stress. And uh, you never know where stresses are going to come from. For some reason, when I was reading the book, I got this picture of like, you know, a big top circus tent. And if you've got it designed by planners, it's going to have one pole and that's it. And a stress comes in like a hurricane from one side and that whole thing, that pole can snap, the whole thing can collapse. Uh, with the free market, it's like a whole bunch of people going around with a whole bunch of little poles and they see one side starting to, uh, you know, collapse in a little bit and a whole bunch of poles go up. It's stronger from then on uh, toward those stressors. And so it, it automatically gets better and better. Uh, resilience is the ability to resist a stress, not get stronger because of the stress. Uh, fragility is something where it's planned in advance and uh, the and you can't take every possible stress into account when you're making those plans, making it more likely to collapse like our current financial system. So <laughs> DeFi is the answer to this. But um, go ahead with, you, you know, you sure. were going to talk about anti-fragile. I just want to make sure the audience knows what anti-fragile is first. <laughs> You hit it on the head, Mike. So it was a concept that we should really understand because our bodies are anti-fragile, right? We stress our bodies and they get stronger, lifting weights or, or going out and running to, to make your heart stronger. Like you said, free market capitalism has creative destruction, but that allows the capital to flow where it needs to be and it makes the entire system stronger. So free market capitalism is actually anti-fragile. And cryptocurrencies, it's the same way. There are entire concepts within the cryptocurrency space that fail. We'll say like algorithmic stable coins. We had a huge blow up of that last year and people aren't yeah. going to try that again for a long time. It was called Terra Luna. Um, so they put the focus on 
the fully backed stable coins like USDC. Um, all of this is computer code. So here's another example where it's anti-fragile. It's all computer code. And there's always going to be bugs or flaws or things like that in computer code. But when either a hacker or somebody tries to take advantage of one of these things, they learn from that or a white hack hacker let, lets people know and everybody learns from that experience and puts controls in place to make sure those things don't happen again. These are the hallmarks of an anti-fragile system. It just gets stronger. And like you said, you compare that to a fragile system. So just to recap, a fragile system, when it's stressed, it breaks. A robust system, when it's stressed, it doesn't get stronger, but it, it resists that change. And then an anti-fragile system is act, something that actually gets stronger. Um, the system we use now, fractional reserve banking, we've had the same failures in that over and over and over again. 1906 was a huge one. 1929, they had to revamp the system in 1945. Again, in 1971, we had the savings and loan crisis. We had the financial crisis in 2008. Um, and then we have peppered throughout all that, we have smaller banking crises. And it's always the same thing, right? So in the case of the last one that happened, they had a bunch of stimulus went out. So people had money to deposit into banks. Banks took that money and they invested in long-term assets. And then some of those banks came under stress. So people started to take their money out. All the bank can do is sell those assets, maybe at a 70, 70 cents on the dollar, and they don't have enough money to, to pay their depositors back. And once again, it fails. And they've tried over and over again to make that system more robust, doing things like putting the full faith and credit of the government behind it. You shouldn't have to do that in an in industry. And there's just a stark contrast with how you see the crypto industry getting stronger uh, compared to this fractional reserve banking system that we've been dealing with for years. At very least, we need to have this alternative, this anti-fragile uh, alternative to make sure the, the rest of it is behaving properly. So again, it's just a stark co contrast between the two. Okay. Two things I want to say about that. Uh, one, you use the term money quite, a, quite often when you were talking about currency. Uh, and, you know, a lot of people think that I'm sort of, I see a hair here. <laughs> uh, a lot of people think that I'm sort of crazy uh, talking about the difference between money and currency. But I will flog this thing until the day I die. It doesn't matter if, you know, I didn't invent this. Aristotle was the first one to describe the key functions of, of, of money. And there are three of them. And then there are a bunch of attributes that money should have. Uh, but the three key functions are a store of value, a medium of exchange, and a unit of account. Otherwise, it won't operate. Uh, and a store of value, even the Federal Reserve says that's when you go to their website, it says first. So in other words, the most important function is that it must store value. <laughs> Uh, you know, you look around the world at currencies, the Turkish lira, uh, and then I can't remember what the, the I think it's Lebanese sterling uh, uh, recently, you know, the, over the past six months or whatever, they experienced some severe problems. And in a single day or on a certain hour, they will be devalued by 50 percent, something like that. Just crazy stuff that can't happen with money. It means that it's a currency. It doesn't it, it's currency is whatever is currently being used as a medium of exchange, currently. So that's- It's current. a bad habit, Mike. It's a bad habit. But, You're right, yeah. words matter. Words matter. Yeah. Uh, and I can't remember what the, the other thing was, but um, uh, I, I do believe that it does matter. And uh, every single economist throughout history has recognized that these three functions are something that mm -hmm. money has to have. And so all of the national fiat currencies that have been around for, you know, have basically sprung into existence over the past century or so uh, that are debt backed and, and uh, don't that, that where units of that currency can be whipped up by indebting a population. Uh, uh, that was another thing. Um, uh, what, you, you said the full faith in, that it's backed by the full faith and credit of the United States. Well, <laughs> the full faith and credit of the United States means it's backed by your future taxes. So it isn't the full faith and credit. Mm -hmm. It's the full enslavement of the population of the United States that backs the currency. Mm -hmm. It isn't what backs money. 
the, the gold and silver are called honest money simply because uh, there isn't any enslavement. There isn't, there's no fraud, theft, or enslavement involved in using money. Uh, it is the foundation of national currencies that they are, they are created, they come into existence through fraud, theft, and enslavement. And, uh, and so to me, it's extremely important. And I don't care if I'm the first person in modern times to point this out because I didn't invent it. I, I just, I didn't discover it. I just uh, recognized it, you know, that, it, that it, this exists. The people in Weimar, Germany during the hyperinflation, everybody was recognizing it and they would dump their marks for a box of doorknobs if necessary, because right. that would hold its value. Over yeah, it's, it's why having these alternative systems and gold and silver and, and cryptocurrency networks and, and the currencies that are associated with them are so important to have those, those yes. alternatives. Yes, right. Okay, so uh, let's go on. You know, you had uh, in your uh, email when we were preparing for this, you had a bunch of use cases, for instance. So uh, if you want to go on, to show us or, you know, describe why um, Hashgraph is probably one of the best choices of distributed ledgers out there, if not the best. And, you know, it started out way, way back on the, uh, you know, uh, coin market cap uh, lists all of the different uh, cryptos uh, based on their uh, market cap and their uh, their use cases. You can select, but right now uh, I think uh, Hedera has H bar has been sitting at like number between number thirty and thirty three. Uh, it started way way back there, but it's it's getting climbing, uh, but. <laughs> In my opinion, it deserves to be in the top three, not, well, not number 30, but three. <laughs> you know, like, uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I agree. The The thing is, Hedera's doing exactly what they said they're going to do. And I'm just speaking for, for myself here. But they said that they were going to use their H bar and use it in the market. That's the resource they have to build out the ecosystem. Now, that puts pressure, that is supply that gets put on the market. It really takes a while then to build out the ecosystem and bring true value to the network um, before you start to impact price on the other way. And I think that's causing maybe some confusion in the market, but the market can remain irrational for a really long time. And I think that's that's all we're seeing with the H bar. But as you said, we've made some significant moves already, but the real moves are happening with these use cases. And I'd be happy to cover some of them if you'd like. Uh, yeah, because I think that's the turning point. And to me, the opportunity is uh, getting in ahead of which I did. Uh, but I'm just uh, I'm frustrated right now because it's been sitting down at a nickel for so long. Don't be, <laughs> but, don't be. But this is getting in ahead of uh, the realization of all of these use cases, how functional it is. Uh, to me, that is the opportunity. The, the opportunity is the difference between the current price and the future value. And, and that's what we're trying to build is, is that future value. And these are just things from the time we talked just a few months ago uh, that have happened since then. So right then when we talked last time, they had just launched a really big uh, use case called AppMyO. Uh, it uses that data logging service, the Hedera consensus service, to track items through their, uh, their supply chains. And at the time, we were really impressed because we were processing between four and 700 transactions per second, which made Hedera the most used network by that metric by a pretty good margin. But since that time, in just a few months, it's increased to 13 to 1400 transactions per second. And the network isn't breaking a sweat. Uh, we've had other things. Just last week, we had Shinhan Bank. It's the uh, oldest uh, bank in Korea and one of the largest uh, banking institutions in Korea. They did a proof of concept with the largest financial institution of Taiwan. They haven't named it, but I'm sure we can figure it out knowing that it's the largest financial institution in Taiwan. Um, they did this remittance proof of concept. They did it on the Hedera network where they achieved both real-time settlement and real-time foreign exchange rate integration across three currencies, the Thai bot, the Taiwanese dollar, and the Korean won. And these are huge institutions that are doing this and finding true value. It's the second uh, proof of concept that the Shinhan Bank had done. They did another one with- uh, I, I want to ask you something sure. real quick. Uh, 
uh, through the SWIFT system or any other method that currently exists, is there anything that can do that many transactions per second and settle so quickly? No, I mean, for for example, the uh, so right this now, is a huge improvement over it's, it's a, on on all kinds of things on several different fronts. But Hedera is the most efficient network. It's a thousand times more efficient than Visa, the traditional rails that we use right now. So that just shows kind of the efficiency. But yeah, this was the second proof of concept. The first one was done with Standard Bank in Africa. It's the largest bank in Africa. So they're continuing these proof of concepts, and you know what happens next. Eventually, it's going to come to market, and it's going to compete or replace place things like Swift. Uh, we had the last time we were here, we talked about Aberdeen and Aberdeen is a huge asset manager in the UK. They have a half a trillion dollars worth of assets under management. And I mentioned last time that they were planning on starting to tokenize their funds in 2023. But, you know, it was just a concept. We were just hoping that it was going to happen. They've started to do that. They tokenized uh, one of their money market funds to the tune of 16 billion dollars. So they're starting to tokenize these funds. And that's the first step before you start to get like to a DeFi model for some of these assets. We have another one of the Hedera governing council members, DLA Piper. One of their subsidiaries is called Toco, and they focus on tokenizing securities. They've started to do that with some bonds, and they've been doing that over the past few months with real estate. They did a proof of concept with uh, Quarter Homes in Colorado. And not only did they tokenize a mortgage, but they fractionalized it into many different pieces, which allows those to be in those columns that we were talking about for uh, the different assets and make them easily to trade back and forth, back and forth. So now all of these different assets start to add up. There's something in the cryptocurrency industry called total value locked. And those are those liquidity pools we talked about for those decentralized exchange exchanges. But here we have total value represented, these traditional assets that are being represented on a ledger. And I consider stable coins as part of that because they're backed up by different fiat currencies. Um, so Ethereum has a lot of those stable coins. So it's still in the number one spot. But now with this uh, $16 billion worth of assets being tokenized on Hedera, Hedera is in the number two spot. And this is only going to increase as Toco continues their, their work uh, and places like Red Swan, another one that's tokenizing uh, real estate on the Hedera network. And it really starts to open up the democratization of finance. Here's another one. It's going to sound a little bit strange, but there was a racehorse in the Middle East that was tokenized on Hedera and divided into a thousand different pieces. And what makes that interesting is when you think of somebody who owns a racehorse, who do you think of? It's somebody that's rich, wealthy, right? Those are the only okay. people that can own those. But here you might have somebody that's just a fan of the horse or a fan of racing. And now you can split it up into a thousand pieces and it's a bare asset. So it goes from account to account, can be swapped back and forth really easily. That would be an absolute nightmare for the lawyers out there and everybody who would try to do that in some of our traditional methods. But now that can be done really easily. So, so those are some of the things that are going on with tokenization. We also have some exciting things going on in consumer engagement. Uh, people are going to laugh that watch me on a regular basis because I'm not supposed to have a favorite use case out there. Uh, but certainly my company, Twitter, is one of them. But the other one is Karate Combat. Um, Karate Combat is a, a strike league like MMA, kind of like UFC. And what they've done is they don't have equity anymore. They don't have ownership. All they have is this karate token that they minted on Hedera. And what they do with it, it's not it doesn't represent ownership. It's kind of like a loyalty point. And what they've done is they have about 10 fights per year and each or 10 fight cards per year. And on each one of those fight cards has about 10 fights. And what you can do is they have airdrops initiatives where you can get those tokens for free, or you can go on one of those decentralized or centralized exchanges and buy some of these karate tokens and send them to your account, which is the interface for that is the karate combat app. And during those or the week prior to those fights, you can pick which fights fighters you think are going to win. And if they win, you get more karate tokens. It's up only gaming. If you lose, you don't lose any tokens. I'm a big fan of football as well. And I've watched uh, my, my team is the Eagles. I've watched them in the Super Bowl. And those are some engaging sports uh, events. But I watched the last one when I had some skin in the game. I bought some karate and I, I did this. It was an amazing event. You know, I'm not normally a gambler, but it brought that whole fight league and that fight, even though the fights were, were amazing, it brought it to an entirely new level. And we have that going on across the board. Uh, we also have stuff going on in, in the healthcare space, but I'll pause there real quick, Mike. 
Okay. Um, well, one of the things, you know, uh, you mentioned Twigital, and I'd, I'd like you to, to uh, tell us about that a bit more. So that's uh, sure. fascinating. So Twigital, um, I left a 20 year career to come in full time into this space. And uh, one of the things I did was start working with community engagement with the HBAR Foundation. And the other thing, it's very hard to be in this space and not want to build. Um, Hedera also attracts a, a lot of really sharp people. And one of those people is my partner, Jesse Damro. He listened very closely to Lehman Baird, and Lehman Baird is the uh, inventor of that hash graph algorithm and one of the co-founders of Hedera. And over and over again, he would say things like, the world will be tokenized. Everything of value in the world will be tokenized. And Jesse looked at that and he's like, you know, we know it's going to be things like securities and, and we talked about stocks and bonds and everything like that. But Jesse looked at it and he's like, well, how about all the physical things out there? How, how about everything that's on your display shelves or in museums or our collectibles? How can we tokenize those things, the things that we treasure? And we've had new technologies come out recently that um, allow you to create these 3D files, these 3D assets. And there's a couple of different ones. There's GLB, and then there's a .usdz file, universal scene description file. And they're these amazing 3D uh, files that you can interact with in digital immersive environments, uh, and you can zoom in on them, you can, you can focus on them, you can spin them around, look at them, all that kind of stuff. And so he figured that that was the best way to capture physical objects. So what we set ourselves to doing is creating an application that allows you to create those assets. And right now we're looking at uh, several different technologies, but the initial iteration, the one that we're using right now, you just take a few dozen pictures of an object and it creates one of these 3D assets. And then it mints that into an NFT on the Hedera network. So... And you can add additional. So you go, you go can ahead. Re you could register all of the physical assets that you own, and it's it's a unique, it's an, a non fungible token, where uh, it it isn't. You can't duplicate it. It's this unique registration of any object that you own. So a a, a car, a piece of art, anything. You take pictures of it from all different angles, mm -hmm. and it puts that together into something where you could see uh, if it was a car, you'd be able to zoom up and see, uh, you know, some collector car, you'd be able to see any bit of rust or uh, a paint chip or anything like that and be able to uh, have somebody appraise or value that thing based on the NFT, right? Exactly. So, you know, you could use it as digital receipts. It could fight counterfeiting out there. So I know handbags, right? The leather handbags, they're, they're one thing that get counterfeited all the time, but that leather is like a fingerprint. So if you capture it in this way and that follows the item through its life cycle, you don't have to worry about counterfeiting anymore. You could just document the physical condition of items for insurance, for posterity. My, my partner often does it for his kid's art right? That belongs in a museum. <laughs> they bring it home. It's only going to last a few weeks, a few months, or a few years, and then it's going to get destroyed. But if you capture it this way, then you can keep it forever and you can put it in these digitally immersive environments. Uh, of course, we talked about these are assets, so they can be traded on three uh, Web3 marketplaces. It's one of those assets in the column. Um, the one thing that's really getting us exciting right now is just using these for display in the metaverse. Uh, we have of course, Facebook has become meta. They've dumped tens of billions of dollars into that space. And then we have Apple that's moving into the space right now with those their AR, VR goggles. They're not going to come out until next year, but we've found that our assets work perfectly with this. Uh, they've put out their SDKs, and again, it's, it's preliminary, but as I said, you can have multiple files. I'll, I'll give a quick example. So you have, um, I went down to one of these karate combat events, and I got one of the gloves signed by two very famous MMA fighters, Boss Rutten and George St. Pierre. I also got a picture with those guys hold, holding the glove. It adds authenticity to it. I did an interview with George St. Pierre. So I have that video that can all be attached as files to add, again, authenticity to it, to add to the story. And one thing that Hedera is exploring now, or the Hedera the community is exploring, is having dynamic NFTs. So you can have those initial files. And what I would like to see is those initial files are immutable. They can't be changed on the NFT. But you can add additional files to it throughout time, certificates of authenticity additional pictures you get maybe with George St. Pierre or whatever it is, because a lot of times these assets, 
it's more about the story than the object itself. It's more about, and this allows you to tell that story as that object goes through its life cycle. And right now, again, with, I'll try to send, send you a clip. We've interacted with the SDK uh, on Apple Vision Pro, and you can pop up and bring up that asset, and you, it'll sit there and spin. Now, this is going to get more interesting as we go forward, and in augmented reality, you're going to be able to take that object again and inspect it. And then more information will pop up. We have these Twidgetal certs that have more information that, that come along with it. You can look at that in another, a separate window. At another window, you might have that interview or the pictures, things along those lines. So there are all kinds of things we can do with these. And we feel like with the big pushes that these huge companies are doing, we're in a really good spot. Wow. Uh, you know, while you were saying all of this, it, it just made me think of a potential use application. I'm wondering if Twidgetal could actually do this. Uh, in just the next few years, the next three years or so, uh, actors will become obsolete. You won't need them. Uh, and uh, I mean, through artificial intelligence, an entire movie will be able to be created. Uh, and it's, it's, all of this is happening very, very fast. Uh, could an actor uh, basically um, put a trademark on themselves, their image and so on, by getting scanned by this thing completely, and then uh, by uploading uh, photos and, and images of previous films and so on, could, for instance... Uh, a movie producer uh, uh, purchase from Brad Pitt, for instance, the ability to select any age that he's at, <laughs> have it convert this, you know, he does some different facial expressions and so on, and, and, uh, and older movies could be used as a source, but they could pick any age of any actor that is recognizable, that's out there, that helps sell box office, uh, uh, is that a potential use case for uh, being able to purchase an asset, Brad Pitt, put him in a movie without Brad Pitt ever having to be there? <laughs> but him still being being able to collect the value. So these USDZ yeah. files, the Pixar movies you see, most of the objects are these USDZ files. They're actual objects that have been captured in this way. And that's why we call them assets because they actually hold true value. Now, all the um, the AI generated imagery, those are generated through the images that are just found on the internet. And we have to find a way to, to have ownership. So the value of that goes back to the creator, the owner of this. And this is exactly what we're talking about. We want to be able to represent that value in a provable way. And that's all. That's what Twidgetal is all about. Excellent. Okay. Uh, you know, I think we, unless you have anything to add, do you have another top, topic you want to cover? I I, I did want to touch on healthcare because I, I do think that's that's something that is important. Uh, we had Coinbase had gotten into some regulatory issues. Uh, I think some of that is going to abate. But I think during that time when the SEC brought a suit against them, they wanted to show the value that the cryptocurrency industry is bringing beyond speculation. Speculation is important because it brings capital into the space, which is certainly important. But there are so many other things of value. And one of the things that they highlighted, this is Coinbase highlighted, was something called Acor, which is some underlying infrastructure, but it facilitated something called Health Ready. And Health Ready is, uh, they saw a problem with connecting patients and clinical trials. And what they have done is found a way to take the information, obscure it, and allow that information to be uh, passed between those parties, but make sure that the privacy issues aren't aren't part of the problem, right? They, they've they obscured some of that stuff. They're, and they started out actually with um, pediatric cancer patients and making sure that the information that they had got to the clinical trials and vice versa so they can make the connections that, that are necessary that can potentially save lives. So that's another place where uh, Hedera is excelling. I hope that Coinbase continues to focus on these value add use cases outside of speculation because that's where Hedera's bread and butter is. And that's what we're trying to do. Touch every single industry with this new technology. Okay, well... Thanks. This has been a great update. You know, I've I rarely have time to uh, uh, to spend uh, analyzing and learning about all of this stuff. Uh, my specialty is precious metals, economics, and monetary history, and I try and stick with those. 
and uh, to uh, really know what you're talking about, you have to totally immerse yourself in something like you have with uh, Hedera Hashgraph. So I want to thank you for this uh, great update. I hope the audience got some value out of this. And uh, we're, we're going to check in again soon. So, yeah. Ab absolutely, Mike. You, you keep focusing on the things that, that you're passionate about. I'll keep focusing on the things that I'm passionate about. And I'll come back and update you as needed. Okay. Thanks. We'll see you next time. I want to thank the audience for watching.